Welcome, everyone. I am very honored today to be in conversation with Tom Yeomans, who I've known for I think almost 30 years now and have profound respect for him and his work. And we're going to be talking today about his book that he published in 2020, Holy Fire, The Process of Soul Awakening. And we're going to be in conversation together about his understanding of the soul awakening process and also how that relates to my understanding of astrological wisdom. So it should be a rich conversation, but thank you for being here today, Tom. Oh, well, thank you so much for inviting me, Heather, and uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation a great deal. But before we begin, let me just give a little bit of background about Tom, and then we'll launch into our dialogue together. Let me just uh, read your brief bio, Tom. He is the founder and director of the Concord Institute and co-founder with Russian colleagues of the International School, a postgraduate training institute in St. Petersburg, Russia, where I've been, and it's an extraordinary program. Um, he completed training in psychosynthesis in 1974 and studied and trained with Roberto Asigioli in Italy and has worked as a therapist, teacher, trainer of professionals in psychosynthesis and spiritual psychology throughout North America and Europe and Russia. He's a published author, poet, painter, musician, and author of this amazing book, Holy Fire. So wonderful to be in this conversation with you today, Tom. And maybe you could start by talking a little bit about your journey and how you came to write this book, which is the culmination of your extensive inner and outer journey in your own soul awakening. I will. Um, I was thinking about that this morning. I think that... Uh... I was thinking about my the life my life cycle, I suppose, since I'm now almost 83. Uh, I've lived a long time. And I think that I had an innate spiritual sensitivity as a boy, as a little boy. And uh, <clears throat> that, that was there was something that was already there, let's put it that way. And uh, and yet, as I grew, as I was in a particular family, as I uh, was in a particular culture, particularly a rather intellectual, academic culture uh, of Cambridge and, and Boston, uh, I uh, fell away from that innate knowing. And uh, I can see there are particular moments when I was able to reconnect it, but the force of my life, both uh, the enculturation and also some of the traumas uh, led me away from this sensitivity. And I think the reason I'm saying that is that it, I felt a loss at some level. And when I finished college, uh, I had no sense of what I was going to do, but I had this already this yearning of wanting to understand how where that went or what it was or how you connect to it. But I didn't have that art, it articulated. I think I had it as a yearning. So I had this very troubled uh, 20s where I kept leaving degree programs uh, and uh, not being satisfied. And people who loved me were wondering. I had a, a, a dowager aunt in Chicago who said, Tom, I'm afraid you're becoming a rolling stone. <laughs> <laughs> my father sort of rolled his eyes he, he couldn't he says why do you keep leaving things that you're good at mm. uh, but there was a, I was following something and uh, I had a clue in a course that I took with Paul Tillich uh, at, Co at Harvard before, uh, before I left which was on the self-interpretation of man in western thought that was a Paul Tillich kind of title mm. you know but he was he was wonderful. And the interesting thing was that he, for the last period, which is the modern and postmodern, he said, we don't know. We don't know what we can become, that there's something unfinished 
about where we are in the modern world. And of course, <clears throat> that's clearer and clearer that we don't know and that there's tremendous potential, uh, potential but also tremendous disconnection. And our present situation actually expresses both of those things. So I had that. And in my notes at the end, the last thing I wrote in my notes for that course was stay bare and seek. Mm. Stay bare and seek. In other words, stay open to the unknown. Wow. And as I say, my 20s were a struggle. And in my 30s, I finally um, was settling a bit and I was beginning to study psychosynthesis. And <clears throat> I saw the diagram that Asa Jolie uses in the, uh, in the book to demonstrate how this, what you call the soul self, I call it the soul, it can be called the higher self, it can be called any number of things, is integrated into the psychological uh, constitution of the human being. And I saw that diagram and a voice in my head said, this is what I've been looking for. Mm. It's an immediate aha that here was a, a way of thinking that included the soul within, not in a religious context, but in a psychological context. And that is a very important distinction. It's, it won't, uh, I won't go any further there, but certainly we're familiar with the soul in a religious context. This was the soul, in a sense, an existential, psychological, ordinary human experience, that this could be had by people. And <clears throat> I, uh, I, with Anne's encouragement, she's always one step ahead of me, uh, said, let's get more training in this. And so that led to 50 years of working in psychosynthesis, uh, which is kindred to Jung's thinking, but more practical. And uh, Roberto Assagioli was an Italian psychiatrist to quite a remarkable man who we actually got to go study with uh, in the early 70s. And um, so, so then I would say the rest of it has been, there've been many ups and downs uh, and different forms through which I have explored this question, but basically what I've been trying to figure out through teaching, through therapy, through reading, through my own experience, uh, is what is it to know the soul within a psychological context? What are the experiences of that? And how is that experience of one's own vitality, divinity, again, whatever you call it, how is that integrated into our daily life, into our psychological uh, structures of our personality, of our relationships, uh, our vocations? Uh, how do we actually bring this energy of uh, what we might become, our greatest potential, our most mature self, however again you would say it, into the context of daily life. And psychosynthesis is very wonderful in terms of both affirming the presence of the soul within us and at the same time giving people many, many tools to work out the many, many difficulties of that actual expression. So that's a long introduction to the book. I think the book, I could not have written the book uh, earlier. Uh, I needed I needed decades of experience, and I needed also to go to some very dark places. There were there were certainly things uh, that we encountered along the way that were very not spiritual. They were very difficult, and that's always the case. So I had to gain experience, and um, then the other thing I had to do, Heather, was in terms of my enculturation, what I was talking about before. My expectation for myself was that I would write an academic book with footnotes, mm. you know, a bibliography, and uh, it would hopefully be the final statement on the soul and, uh, you know, all that. And <clears throat> a friend of mine, I was trying to write a book and do it that way, and I was getting nowhere. It just wouldn't work. And a friend of ours uh, read the manuscript and said, Tom, you know what, you're not in this book. And I recognized what she was saying, that I, 
my own soul, my own being. I was doing the book with some parts of my personality, but not with who I was. She said, take the summer off and then write a book as if you were leaving the city. But he, she mentioned Li Po, leaving the city, and you wanted to share with your colleagues what you learned. And thank God uh, she said that. And I started a, a completely different book using the material, but in a completely different tone which was experiential and uh, personal. It was my teaching voice. And I then worked for three years on it, very intensely, writing several hours a day uh, to really get what I wanted. And it's an interesting book because it has a tremendous amount of information in it, but it's a companion book. Mm. And... What's happened now, uh, is, I've been out three years, uh, people have written me letters from all over you know, Europe and the United States, and people from different vocations and walks of life that somehow the book has come into their hands. And they say, I keep this book by my bedside table at night. I carry this book when whatever. I open this book, and it just seems to be saying the right thing to me. So I have 60... 60 pages of letters from people uh, saying, I keep this book close by. And I think Heather, that's what I wanted to write was something that would companion people in their actual spiritual journey, their struggles, their sensitivity to their own soul, their sense of what got in the way, the work they have to do, and so forth and so on. So that's a, the, the book took a long time coming, and uh, but it, I think it's it's I'm in it. I guess that's well, you're very <laughs> in it, and and it is very experiential and very accessible, and yet very profound and mm. and beautifully written. You include some of your poetry in the book. Yeah. You include a lot of exercises to support people in their healing and soul awakening process yeah. and and talk some about some of those phases of the soul awakening that you describe in the book because i think that's very profound yeah well you know i i uh first i would say is that uh, given my experience of my, what i said i knew from the beginning the the first thing is to shift the proposition from that, and Jung, Jung was the first person to say this, but to somehow you you live your life and then you you go to church or then you get this you get the soul self in the second half of life after you've integrated your personality, after you've achieved in the culture and so forth, then you have an awakening. That was an older model. And the first thing was to say it's there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we fall away from it. We are uh, either through trauma, but even in culturation, education, families that don't resonate, being with people who don't resonate to who you are, you lose confidence in that place. I lost confidence in that place within myself, thought I had to be an achiever, you know, in order to survive in the culture that I was in. So one proposition is that the soul is there from the beginning. Once you say that, then you're in constant relationship to it. Mm -hmm. It can be the relationship of non-relationship. But you're or in the relationship. soul wound that you describe, where you disconnect from that part of yourself, right? And, so, and develop a false persona. Exactly. So, but that's very reassuring because people, can, in a sense, can look back in their life and see that there were intimations of the soul, and then they lost it. That's different than yearning for something that's still ahead. So, but then the second thing is. It's not enough just to have that experience. And this, I think this has been another confusion in spiritual life is that somehow if we got high enough, and this is particularly true in the California in the 60s and 70s and the 80s, if you got high enough, you somehow would be self-realized. So that led to a lot of problems of people trying to transcend their personalities and their troubles and get into a place of bliss. Or, or spiritual whatever. bypass. Yeah, a pure spiritual bypass. So the other side of it, yes, the soul exists too. We exist in this world. 
and and this and basically you as a soul want to be fully here want to be fully alive and the other thing that changed it for me was i listened to joseph campbell and bill moyers and it, and uh, they were talking about meaning kind of the jungian idea of purpose and meaning and people finding their meaning and and, and uh, bill moyer said isn't it true that everyone's looking for meaning and joseph campbell stopped him and said no he said what people are looking for is the experience of being fully alive Mm. Of rapture of being fully alive and he uses the word rapture which is interesting so that you then have a process where you, you me anybody at, is is a deep source of vitality and, and holy fire actually is, is a source of holy fire using that as a metaphor that holy fire wants to be fully expressed through personal life that's what the soul that's what soul realization is so then you have to pay very close attention to your personality and how it's configured how it's wounded uh how it's working how it's not working uh there's just a lot of psychological work to be done so this bring, brings me to the stages i posited that there were four stages of awakening and all equally important that's important it's not mm -hmm. like you do you go along and then you you get this awakening and the first stage is really to uh, in the psychosynthesis term is disidentify come to a center to step back to be able to observe your own experience and you really can't have soul realization without that and when people the jump over soul. that yeah it doesn't work so that's the first awakening second awakening is remembering so to speak that you are a soul that you have a soul that you are this deep source of vitality and you can express that energy and vitality so that's that's an important and we live in a secular culture that it doesn't necessarily affirm that so that's the second awakening is to the, if you want to say the fact of the soul. Then the third awakening is the process I just described of from that place of vitality or opening to it or however it comes, building a vehicle, an instrument of, in your person and your personal life and your relationships that expresses that energy. So, so like incarnating it. Incarnating it. So mm -hmm. you, you basically... Be, become radiant in, in a sense in daily life just not on sundays and, and then the fourth stage is what more traditionally is seen as spiritual where you gradually recognize that you are part of everything and you, you in a sense in a funny way open back up again but from this grounded place and therefore you can hold the fact that we are one with everything, one with the universe, however that's expressed, one with God, you can hold that safely because you have a strong personality and personal life in which it can be grounded. So those four uh, stages of awakening, I think, have been very useful to people. And I want to say again, you can't jump over them, any of them. They all are part of a very complex process of soul awakening over the course of a lifetime and uh, there's no rushing it either oh that's the other thing i want to say is that important in the book and important in my work is um to posit the existence of a natural inborn drive within the human being to maturation and spiritual awakening so you're not imposing anything what you're doing is try to get as close as possible to a person's experience and help them find whatever the step, next step in that process is. So you're dealing with a deeply natural aspect of our of our our, our being. It's nothing. You're not in, you're not imposing spiritual life. You're, you're trying to give birth, welcome uh, the energies of the soul. Mature, maturity is a beautiful word because it's a, it means ripeness. You're, you're trying to help, and pe help people ripen into who they are. 
and not Moses, you know, but who they are, <laughs> you know. Well, and and to be on that journey of evolution of the soul and how it is embodying here, you know, it's extraordinary listening to you, Tom, because uh, one way in which I work with astrology is called evolutionary astrology, yeah. which really holds not only that awareness that in this incarnation, in this embodiment, we're working out this next phase of our soul's journey and our soul's evolution, but that we carry that journey through many lifetimes, many yeah. incarnations, and that the chart, the birth chart is really a, a guide to the soul's intentions in this lifetime right in terms of that growth and development and that we can the the chart can help guide us in what was some of that deeper soul's intention in terms of these next phases of growth and movement towards wholeness in mm -hmm. this lifetime, but you're really, you're weaving in that understanding that that is our essence. Right. And we come to have this experience in order to continue on that path of growth and evolution and gaining in love and wisdom. Mm -hmm. Does the chart re reveal also anything of the previous struggles or the, or, or is it just within the lifetime? What's extraordinary, and I really have been very influenced by uh, Jeff Green's work, mm -hmm. and his he describes how Pluto in the chart speaks to the soul's journey, and you can see with where Pluto is in the chart, what was the focus of your soul's work in the past lifetime, what are your intentions in terms of this next phase in this lifetime? Yeah. And you can also see indications in the chart of what the past life trauma may have been. Yeah. And also, one of the things that's really profound is the transpersonal planets can indicate some of how our soul is working these themes of Neptune connecting to oneness. Mm -hmm. Uranus, but how do we find our individuated consciousness? Yeah. Pluto, what is that journey that we're on? And then the inner planets are showing how are we manifesting that? How are we bringing that into form in this personality, in this incarnation, in this lifetime? Yeah. So there are the four awakenings right there. Yeah. You know, Astro Jolie enigmatically said uh, to me at one point, he said, um, a lifetime is a day in the life of the soul. Mm. You know, so we, in terms of the, the way I work, uh, in terms of possible past life traumas or whatever, yes, that can, uh, that's definitely part of the work. And it's interesting to see, and I, I think it would be interesting in terms of, if you want to say the overall maturity of the soul, in terms of the chart, w w where they're mostly working. Because I think there's some souls, in a sense, who take on collective trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a resonance with past trauma, but they're also operating at that collective level. And there are other, other people who, for whom so-called individual trauma is enough. And so that th even within where people are starting, th there can be differences. The key, though, for, for me, and I think it's the th thing that keeps us keeps us safe is that the touchstone is always the immediate experience. It's like what comes into the present moment is what we work with. And so uh, I think you can have a wider view. And at the same time, what aspect of that wider view is coming into the present moment at this time uh, in order to be worked with. And that al allows whatever the work is, no matter how esoteric or whatever, to be grounded in, in the present moment. Well, that's one of the powerful things that you talk about in the book that I really love, Tom, is you, you move beyond the dualities and the polarization because you talk about how the soul is our inner experience as well as you know our experience in this reality that there that it isn't about transcendence versus imminence. It right. is about holding both and and it is about 
that spiritual experience of interconnectedness and oneness, but also embracing our unique expression right. of soul in this lifetime. And I think one of the things that I think is really important is we're moving into the age of Aquarius from that astrological perspective is mm -hmm. we're, we're reweaving the sacred masculine, the sacred feminine. We're reintegrating that understanding of transcendence and imminence and moving beyond the, the dualities and polarities. Yeah. But it also speaks to, from that astrological perspective, not only are we in an individual journey of the soul's evolution, right. but we're collectively as humanity right. in these cycles of evolution of consciousness. And that we're, and, and you speak to this in the book also, that we're at a critical juncture right now in yeah. terms of our collective evolutionary process and our consciousness and our connection to our collective soul. Yeah. Absolutely, I think, and uh, and and of course, it, it's chaotic and uh, frightening, and all the things where things begin to disintegrate and change very fast as they are now. But it also has tremendous potential uh, to recalibrate, reorganize, to synthesize. You know, all all the things that we're talking about, so that we actually, I love this word maturity. We gain uh, a greater degree of maturity as a species. And you know, uh, one of the things I like about um, that word maturity, right? You know, your ripeness is that a peach, in order to ripen, doesn't say, "Well, I don't want to have that rainstorm. I don't want to have that snowstorm. Uh, I just want to have sun all the time." Whatever <laughs> the peach, metaphorically speaking, takes whatever it gets. And I think that uh, we human beings need to. Uh, in a sense, know that whatever has come into our life is here for us to learn from. And it is actually an aspect of our soul, as you said, in the moment. Is it? But it's also, it's if you were your soul, you wouldn't want to leave out that piece because there would be a piece of you that hadn't been fully realized. So it's a way of looking at suffering and difficulty and challenges and struggles and all the things that we're facing is that these, these, are, are, these are aspects of our soul that we need to learn from in order to ripen. And it keeps the balance between light and dark. It, it keeps the polarities moving, uh, it moving, but also being held in some larger context. Yeah. Well, you used the phrase at, at one point, and, and I'd love to circle back to this at some point, Tom, but you talked about holy darkness yes. and the dark night of the soul. And it's interesting that in from an astrological perspective, Pluto represents the soul's journey, the evolution of our spiritual process. But where Pluto is, is also often where we experience trauma. Right. And one of the things that I think is really critical that we've in modern culture we try to override those experiences or or bypass or medicate or numb those experiences of being in the darkness right and pluto really speaks to that wisdom that we are always in this journey of transformation of being pulled into the underworld whether it's through crisis or illness or loss to be in this journey of transformation, to go through this death rebirth and emerge in a new form, in a new way. Absolutely. Um, it's like Rumi's phrase, the wound is where the light comes in. That's that right. <laughs> we're, we're here in this experience to be in this process of living on this earth plane and having these experiences, but in everything we can be in that process of growth and evolution. Right. And you know, you, you, if you think about it, you think if you think about the mature older people that you know, like there's some people around here, some farmers that I know, old farmers, they have been through everything. And they've been able to do just what you're, you're saying, you know, assimilating, dealing with whatever uh, 
the challenges have been, and this would be true, and I'm just choosing the farmers because they're around here, and they have they have a, a wisdom and maturity that's born out of that those difficulties. It's also born out of everything else too. Good crops, good years, big family, so so forth and so on. So what you get then is a fully individualized, unique human being who is so self-realized. Mm. In other words, it's, it's paradoxical. And again, there was confusion earlier around the soul that somehow you left all those boundaries and became one. And the cults were based on that, basically. Uh, they were, you know, everyone wears white. Uh, you surrender to the guru. You you let go of your personality, your judgment, and so forth, in order to be in union with something larger. Well, we got into all sorts of trouble with that. So this is a way of looking at you don't give up your particularity. In fact, it is enhanced, but it's it's serving this deep vitality, what we're calling the soul, soul self. Uh, and that leads to a, uh, I, that's why I like maturity, because, you know, that peach that's mature really tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, part of what you're talking about, too, and I think this is important in terms of our collective journey of growing in consciousness and soul awakening, that, you know, and, and this is part of my work is looking yeah. at the journey through the processional cycle and the different astrological ages that the age of Taurus prior to the patriarchal period was a time where we honored the sacredness in embodiment. Mm -hmm. Everything around us is an expression of cosmic consciousness and is holy, is sacred. Yeah. We moved into the patriarchal period with the age of Aries about 2000 BC and then shifted into an orientation of spirituality is transcendent right it right. is what's beyond us and outside of us and that can lead to these cults or these notions of we disconnect from this embodied experience to be in transcendent pure spirituality yeah. But we're really now a critical, I think, process for us as humanity on the planet is to weave those together Good. and to know that everything around us is sacred. We can't exploit the earth and the life forms around us. They're sacred. Yeah. They're an expression of cosmic consciousness. Right. We're a part of that oneness. But as you said, we're also a unique expression of that. And yep. so it is moving beyond the dualities and the polarities to come back into wholeness. That's a beautiful way of saying it. Yeah. And that's the big picture. You know, that's in terms of what's what's happening to us as a species and on the planet. And that and I love those stages coming. And you know, I I I have been one of the people who have, have been expressed some of the cautions about the transcendent, but of course. The transcendent. We needed. We needed. We needed to know that. We and now we're sort of learning some of the negative side effects as we outgrow it and move toward the synthesis that you're talking about. So uh, I I was thinking about myself uh, at the beginning of my life. I think I was predominantly a mystic, very mm -hmm. transcendent, romantic. I was very romantic. It was you know it was like, <laughs> and that was okay except it was ungrounded. And I, as telling my story, I needed to find a way to ground myself. And interesting, when I saw that diagram, I had two thoughts in my head. One is, I found what I've been looking for. And the other was, I can make a living doing this. Mm. And that was equally important, because that was the, th Again, the third. Again, it was the integration. Thing. Yeah, the third awakening and the, and the individuation and the grounding and so forth. So, yeah. I, and I think we, I mean, the exciting thing about being here now is that this is in the air, what you're what you're speaking about. It's in the air, it's in the chart, it's in all sorts of people, despite the troubles that we're having with polarity, with reactionary forces, with, 
you know, with darkness, what I call unholy darkness. Uh, but still, the bigger picture is that I, I'm, you know, I'm a glass half full person, but uh, but that we're we're really we're breaking out into something that I think if we can survive that you know the friction and the chatter and the difficulty is going to be marvelous uh, realization of the species. And I'm holding that. I, I, I'm not promising it. But I hold that as the context for my work still and my teaching. I have faith in the, in the human being. We'll, fi we'll find our way. And of course, the astrological perspective that you just laid out there is wonderful to have because it gives you it gives you perspective on, you know, sometimes the very difficult things that are happening in the moment. So I love, I love it. It gives the perspective of the awareness that we're not on a linear path, right. that we are actually in, on a cyclical or a spiral path of right. evolution and growth. And that as we move through these processional cycles, that the 24,000 year processional cycle at the beginning and ending of a cycle, which is where we are now, yep. and the midpoint. So every 12,000 years, approximately on the planet, we go through this cataclysmic transformational time where it's both you know it, it's it's a crisis point where we then have that choice to make a paradigm leap into a new consciousness or we can resist it and be on a path that is more self-destructive and i think right. that's you know and astrologically we we're at a point Right now, we're Pluto squaring the lunar nodes. It's a choice point. Right. What are we? And I think this is part of what's profound in, in your writing, too, as you talk about the soul awakening. We each have the choice, the responsibility to listen to the voice of the soul within us, yep. to be coming into alignment with that deeper essence of who we are, to come into alignment with our soul selves. And I, I feel like we have that choice collectively now to be yeah. in this process of maturation and evolution or to resist it and be on a path of self-destruction. So it yeah. is a critical time on the planet right now. But it is amazing to me in interacting with different people that I do readings with to Feel the level of awakening that is happening. Okay. And the capacity that is there for us to make this radical leap into a higher consciousness. And, and so you, are you feeling, are you feeling in a sense positive about that? Or what's your what's your sense about, about that possibility? Oh, absolutely. I think that is you know, part of what I truly believe is that the energies of the planets these cosmic energies that are actually impacting our earth more powerfully mm -hmm. right now are all guiding us mm -hmm. in that process of awakening and transformation mm -hmm. if we open to it and if we work with those energies those those energies that are calling us into this growth and evolution are within us and they're outside of us i love that hermetic principle as above so below as it yeah. is outside of us so it is within us as it is within us so it is outside of us so we're in this profound time where our own souls are calling us into that awakening and the energies around us are supporting us like supporting that. It. yeah and you know another thought i have is that uh no one will save us but ourselves, so to speak. In other words, part of the older model, the transcendent model, is that there would be a powerful leader, even a powerful teacher, who would somehow uh, lead us, illumine us, and so forth. And if we gave our lives to Jesus or to Buddha or to whomever, and it's, I think it's so much just what you're saying, is that there's nobody who can help us accept ourselves. Uh, in other words, we are we are the species, the human beings, however you put it, 
we are the ones we've been waiting for. Mm, <laughs> you know as the Hopis would say, yes. Yeah, we, we're the ones we've been waiting for. And that comes to this responsibility of what you're saying is that, yes, we're responsible. We can, if we can see, if we can understand, then we can see what we're choosing and we can choose to be who we are or we can choose to, in the, to be in a more reactive, destructive place. And this is really up to us. So I think this this process, and it sounds like from the astrological pros, uh, perspective too, it really uh, accords personality, I mean, a responsibility to the person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once they're, you know, once they're aware, the whole thing is awareness. Once you, and this is, I think this is where my faith lies, is I believe that a human being, once they're aware, will choose for the most part, to do the right thing. Mm. And that that therefore consciousness and awareness and self-knowledge and all of this is so important so that people have the choice uh, and aren't swept away by unconscious forces of different sorts. So it's it's a, there's personal responsibility is right at the center of this, what we're talking about, this transition, definitely. And that means that the most powerful entity is the species as a whole not any particular person or any particular nation it's it's the collective uh, consciousness of the species which at its root has the is having the experience they're not in touch we're not in touch with it yet but having the experience that we are one with everything with the plants with the animals with the planet as a whole in other words that sustainable culture is embedded in us Mm. that we've been disconnected from. Well, you were talking about the wisdom of the farmers, and I was thinking as yeah. you were talking about that, about Elizabeth Satoris's work, the evolution biologist, and she talks about how as species mature, they, they go through the phase of survival of the fittest, but they come to realize that to really survive and thrive, yeah. we have to honor our interdependence interdependence right. with all that is and our interconnectedness mm -hmm. with the life around us and then we move into maturity and she talks about how so many species are trying to support us humans in that movement into maturity because we seem to be caught in this oh. illusion of survival of the fittest when yeah. it's actually we thrive when we remember that we are a part of the oneness of all of the life around us and of the galaxy. Beautiful. Yeah. And that, that, that knowing or that experience is stored in us. It's there. Yeah. That if I talk about, I knew that as a boy in the woods or sailing a boat, you know, or in the water. When I, I, I knew that. I had that experience. And then I had to leave it. But I didn't leave it. I couldn't leave it. And uh, I feel at the end of my life here that... Uh, um, I regained it. Mm. I, I I know full circle. I, I know it, and uh, I regained it or reclaimed it or however you would say it. But I've also fully differentiated, and you know, I've I made a living. I've sent my kids to college. I've you know had a career. I've uh, I'm I'm a very particular person. So, uh, but it's so I I find it so reassuring to hold that. The species knows at some level that interconnectedness, even if we can't manifest it. And we can't, clearly, right now. But there's all sorts of ways in which we're doing quite the opposite. Yeah. And and I think that's where it is, you know, what we're needing is this radical evolutionary leap into another consciousness. And yep. it is that journey that we can each take personal responsibility, but I also think as we are awakening and uh, it, it, it impacts the collective consciousness. I right. really love Rupert Sheldrake's understanding of morphogenic fields, that the more yeah. of us that awaken, the more it will shift the consciousness of the whole. Yeah. And that that is what is potential now. Yeah. And that's what's profound about this time that we're in. But also, Tom, you, one of the things that's beautiful in the book is you talk about the expression of the soul 
as beauty also. And I know you're a painter and a musician and a poet, but you talk about, you know, you talk about cosmos and yeah. the soul of the cosmos that is that expression of beauty, of order, of harmony, mm-hmm. which I think is also part of what we can tap into within us, that cosmic consciousness that surrounds us and is within us. But talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, it, uh, it's, cer- it's certainly true that I, uh, I love beauty and, uh, and and so the artwork that I do has been has certainly been focused on that. Um, but the word that is this Greek word, this ancient Greek word that Pythagoras uses, which is cosmos with a K, and <clears throat> he uh, he used that word to describe this experience we were just talking about. Is that? the total interconnection of all things in coherence and harmony. So it, for him, it was a musical and a mathematical term. Mm-hmm. And it uh, it comes at beauty, not from the cosmetic side of things, but from uh, the spiritual side of things. Cosmetic, in a sense, is a reduction of the word cosmos. And the beauty of the Greek word is that it means both beauty and deep order at the same time. And it means both beauty and deep order at the macro level, the universal level, but also on the individual level. Mm-hmm. And his metaphor for that was that the strings of the lyre could be tuned to be in harmony with universal harmony. Resonance. And, and there was resonant, and there was no split. Whereas Aristotle and Plato, in different ways, split, objectified or deified. Pythagoras never did. He he never he said the the lyre is expressing the universal when its strings are in tune. So if you think about us, if we tune our lyre to cosmos. Not only do we realize our full maturity or beauty, and you know, it's, it's simple. When a person is connected with who they are, they are beautiful. Mm. And you can see that. You can see you can see the radiance. Uh, you see the radiance. You can see the, the original face comes forward. You see that it's a beautiful person. And when we're dis- disconnected, we're we're less, we're less so. So it's nothing, you know, esoteric. It's just it's right here the beauty of us than the beauty of the world and obviously the the larger whole. So that the book is about that beauty, about that human beauty and uh, the radiance, uh, the resonance, the radiance uh, that comes when two souls are talking to each other or where someone's in touch. And again, this is so the person sees a beautiful sun sunrise, you know, they, and there are all these countless stories. Of, I was driving down 95 and then I suddenly looked at West and, and I just, I couldn't believe how beautiful the sunrise. And I felt all this warmth. I, I just pulled over, pulled the car over and I sat and watched the sunset. And I just felt like everything's going to be okay. And I don't have to rush. And the people I'm going to see, uh, I'll just call them and whatever it is. So people, I think, are always looking to get that resonance from the mm-hmm. natural world and, of course, uh, and from each other. So, again, it's like it's there. It's just yes. we need to find the ways to realize it and allow it to be expressed more fully. So It's beautifully said. And, again, it's it's outside of us and it's within us and it's yeah. you're really talking about that understanding that everything is energy and everything is vibration right. and we're once we from that shamanic perspective tune into the song of our soul yeah we find that harmonic with the symphony of the spheres and then yeah. we're part of that music of the spheres right Right. Uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, again, Pythagoras was, was the one who used that idea of the, of the singing of the stars or the music of the spheres and uh, and a resonance. I mean, I think resonance is uh, sort of macro, micro resonance uh, is 
key to this way of working. I just love what you just said. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And, you know, it's so heartening also. It's just, yes. Yes, let's keep, let's, let's go. <laughs> I feel so inspired listening to you. <laughs> you know? Well, it, it is the potential and the promise of yeah. this time. If we open to that and are really allowing ourselves to be in in balance with the energies that are calling us into that level right. of wholeness and resonance and remembrance. Right. Because right. I think it is, and, and you talk about this in the book too, that our woundedness is when we forget who we truly are. Right. We disconnect from the soul. Right. But as we remember who we are and reconnect with that holy fire, that soul self within us, then we are able to move through this transformational time and come into wholeness. Yeah. 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 I think remembrance is a very good way of putting it because nothing is ever lost, but we get lost. Yeah. We disconnect. Yeah. We disconnect or we're, yeah, we disconnect we're, or we, we are tra traumatized in a way that the, the connection of the soul is attenuated but it's never broken. And actually, uh, what I think what going back to Joseph Campbell or Bill Moyers, he was right that people were yearning. Because as soon as there's a disconnection from the soul, yearning sets in. And yearning actually is the force for reconnection. Okay. So uh Everyone, uh, when Bill Moyer said, uh, you know, aren't people looking for meaning? Uh, you know, it, it was like, aren't people yearning? Yes, they're yearning. But it's not for meaning and purpose primarily. It's for vitality, for being alive. Then, of course, meaning and purpose come from that. Because the soul, you as a soul, want to express. So you'll find out what has the most meaning. Another wonderful quote from Howard Thurman, who was a black minister in the in the 60s he said don't ask what the world needs ask what brings you most alive mm. then go do that because that's what the world needs people who are alive and that's mm. a beautiful place. i can i can hear his voice saying that you know oh it's beautiful and and another way of saying that is that one of the things that i love about astrology is it really when we know our birth chart it's speaking to the uniqueness of who we each are right. as part of this wholeness that we are each a part of the sea of cosmic consciousness but we're each meant to be our own unique fractal expression of that <laughs> and if we aren't expressing that unique creativity of cosmic consciousness yeah. that's missing from the whole from the fabric of the whole. Beautiful, beautiful. So, yeah, yeah. And my metaphor of that is that, that we all can become healthy cells in the body of the world. Mm -hmm. And that the way we become a healthy cell is to be who we are, mm -hmm. you know, and, all, and, and who we truly are and uniquely. And that's completely and utterly differentiated from anyone else on earth. It's like the snowflakes. There are no two snowflakes that are alike. So the unique, there's a real place for the uniqueness as well as the connection. And that, that pair, it's, it's not a polarity, it's a paradox because it's a coexistence of differentiation that allows vitality and expression and, you know, and flavor. <laughs> flavor ingredients <laughs> yeah. that's beautiful well it has been great to be in conversation with you tom and i'd yeah. love to end with your reading um one of your canticles good us. that would be yeah. great yeah and i think it, it captures uh it, it captures what we've been talking about in a good way uh the canticles just to say um these poems are very interesting in how they came to me. I uh, I had an idea <clears throat> of wanting to do them, and I thought, well, there's one about my childhood, and then about uh, sort of adolescence, and then 
you know, midlife and then my older life. That, that's sort of my first concept of it. And then I correlated that with kind of paganism, uh, Christianity, Buddhism, and then uh, I don't know what we call it. New, spiritual. Panentheism. <laughs> okay. Uh, but then, so I, I set out to, to write those, and I actually went to a little bed and breakfast in New Hampshire and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this very intensely. The poems wrote themselves like four mm-hmm. window shades coming down. In other words, they wouldn't write in line. They would, the first one would come down this far, then the second one would come down this far, third one, fourth one. And they, they came down as a whole, even though they differentiated both in terms of my life and also in terms of the so-called religious life. Uh, the line, they came as a whole. So that, that was so they all, were all interwoven. All interwoven, yeah. So this is the last one. It's called Love Now. So that has to do with the present moment, being in the present moment, and love now. Love whatever's going on now. Love it and learn from it. Strange, this journey leading in the end, nowhere but here. The path our breathing, the road our blood. Yet every step is needed to arrive where beauty inundates our veins, suffuses living flesh with darkened light. No wonder we, so long the wanderers, can't see at first we're home and reach among our gatherings for further guidance and a map of God. It seems we've garnered just the things we needed to resume our way, wisdom, knowledge, skill, endurance, but no route opens up or down, no inner finger points or probes. No voice conspires to draw us on. And yet, such sweetness now surrounds, such nearby celebration we scarce can breathe, no more from ancient fear, but from the standing still so close to God. Amazed, we wonder, can this be? Our bodies rooted in the firmament, sun, moon, stars, and earth confiding, in our hearts and minds? What is this marvel of a world that no more falls away and leaves us longing, but presses close to see its cherished progeny? Stunned by love, we sense the primal innocence return, but nearby, dark still spreads its wings. No, this is new, unknown and intricate, Something of earthy fuse and force that pours through every living thing. Here, yes, here is home at last. We've stepped across the threshold stone, alive as we have never been, yet somehow also knowing this was ours at every step along the way. And God, who once embraced, then bade farewell, is here again so near we breathe together one vast love. Oh, who can say when earth will end? Not I, nor you, nor one, but some sweet breath that sweeps the planet's face to keep us company as we lose and find again our oh so ever human grace. Mm. Beautiful. beautiful. It, it has all the things we talked about in it, didn't it? It does. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Oh, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you. Yes. Good luck, all of you out there. <laughs>